uh, and so forth that, that we never, okay, the recording has just started. I'm not gonna start again from the beginning. I will say this is Dr. Betty Tanzi. And I, I, I do wanna say, this is essential for the recording. I'm reporting live from Purdue University. I'm with the Center for C-SPAN Scholarship and Engagement Student Community. And they're right behind me because on the recording, I want that known that where I'm at. The students agreed this evening. They asked me to come and speak tonight. Uh, and we're talking about all things global, but I said, why don't you join me at seven o'clock to hear Dr. Pierre Atlas? And they're also gonna be asking questions. And so they're quite Quite excited about that and we'll see if a lot of questions come afterward at the student union and I wish you could join with that as well but we were just talking about the cold war and we thought that this would be a period we would not see again we have no idea what kind of a period we're entering into right now except that it's extremely volatile and very very frightening I want to say also to all the women who are attending this evening happy international women's day this is a regular poignant Women's Day, I think, this year. Just a few months ago, we were uh, really talking a lot about the women from Afghanistan who had made incredible strides in the 20 years, who had moved uh, out of the shadows and into very active positions within their beloved country, very professionally, international with the NGOs and parliament as attorneys, as journalists. Uh, and now we see the same situation happening with women in, in Ukraine, uh, a very active of engagement and uh, and, and they don't really know the next step. I want to say this morning, I was just telling the students, uh, this morning started off with a rather hard um, comment from a woman, she's a journalist from Ukraine. Uh, she Her children were gone. She sent them off for safety. She herself is pregnant. Uh, she is staying in her role as a journalist. And what she said just absolutely hit me so hard in the heart. She said, you know, we're going to fight this will be hard to hear, but she said, we'll die, be, we, we, we will die before we live on our knees. And I thought, oh my gosh, that is an, that's a very hard statement to say, but as we watch the courage of the Ukrainians doing what we, they're doing, it's, it's, it's um, I, I think we're just in, in, in stunned silence watching this, and, and yet we feel helpless. We'll be talking about that tonight. I'm sure that Dr. Atlas will be bringing that up. I don't want to um, spend much more time, I, other than I'd like to sort of introduce, if my committee can say hello, Ray Montano is going to be later on doing the Q&A. Um, you'll receive instructions about how that's going to work. Uh, for those of you who've come before, you can either put your questions in the chat directly to Ray, or you can ask it yourself. Our students this evening are going to ask their own questions. I I think I saw Claire Collins. Claire is with us this evening. She's also on the committee. And Diane Helmkamp is also with us this evening. Diane Helmkamp Farrell is with us this evening as well. My um, relationship with Diane goes back to high school. And I remember as a, as a Helmkamp, she said, you can call me a Farrell now. I was Farrell for many years. In any event, I'd like to just go ahead and begin. I want to thank you for coming. And again, if you've enjoyed, I think we're sort of halfway past our program series. If you are not a member, um, that's fine. You've been able to enjoy our free um, programming through the virtual programming. Uh, we do look forward to getting back next year live. We're going to try to figure out a hybrid way because we know that many of you have enjoyed the opportunity to, to do this virtually. We want to be able to continue offering that if we if, if, most assuredly. We don't want to abandon that because we know that you've enjoyed that. It's also allowed us to expand our audience around the country as well as around the world. Um, we also are quite keen also to get back to being live. And we'll figure all those out between now and next fall. But we really would welcome your membership. Your membership is important to us as we go out and tell people, these are the people who support us. Uh, we're growing as an organization. Our vision is getting bigger for what we know we can do. We've learned so much during this COVID that people have learned to count on what we're offering. And we've also have learned um, as, as, as we've grown our audience that we're bringing a value to the audience in our informed programs that are very timely and that are of also often very urgent issues. And we wanna be able to continue doing that, uh, but we really do need to do it with your show of support. So you will be hearing from us to so please become a member and also please consider a donation. That, that would mean so much would help us to continue doing what we're doing with even greater depth. And I think for now, I am going to be introducing um, Dr. Atlas is my, oh my gosh, okay, the one thing I did not prepare, and I'm going to let Dr. Atlas do it. Um, I, we, we introduce our speakers, unless you, I don't think done, we introduce our speakers by reading the bios that they send us. And for all the great preparation for this evening, Dr. Atlas, 
Would you like to please tell us about your, I think you probably could do that pretty well. Would you please tell us what you would like for us to know about your background and share with us? Uh, we are so privileged to also have him serve on our board. He's on our board of directors. And some of you may also read his column that he writes for the Indianapolis Business Journal, I believe once a month. And this is a very insightful program that also gives an additional opportunity um, to, for Dr. Alves to share the experience that he has. He um, is currently uh, with Indiana uh, IUPUI, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, for those of you who are not from Indiana. And uh, he brings a tremendous amount of, of a number of gifts and his ability to sort of take the visions that he has for growing engagement um, within the context of not just the United States, but our interactions and intersection with the world, and particularly how, how Indiana intersects with that. Um, Dr. Atlas, may I please ask you to now just present yourself and tell sure. us a bit more. And I'm sorry, I thought, no wait, who's introducing Dr. Ellis tonight? Oh, it's me. <laughs> it's Not been a, a busy day. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, you Betty. You um, and I'm, I'm, good, I'm glad you were able to speak to uh, the students at Purdue. That's great. And I'm glad they're there with you. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just introduce myself and then just immediately go to my, my presentation, I guess, right? That's what I should do? Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Well, um, so I'm Pierre Atlas. Um, I'm a political science uh, professor by training. Um, this is my first year at the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs at IUPUI. Before that, I was at Marion University for over 20 years. Um, I was a full professor of political science over there, and I was the founding director of the Richard Luger Franciscan Center for Global Studies. Some of you may have come to campus over the years to attend the speaker series that I, that I directed at Marion, um, but I've, I've left Marion. I'm now I'm very happy at uh, IUPUI. I, I teach courses in criminal justice and public affairs in both the undergraduate and graduate uh, MPA programs. Um, real quick about me, uh, um, I, I'm a comparative political scientist by training. My original uh, focus was uh, Middle East politics. I've done a lot of uh, research and writing uh, related to the Middle East, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, U.S. foreign policy, which I'll be talking about tonight, civil wars and ethnic conflicts. Um, I taught a wide range of political science classes and other types of courses at Marion, and now I'm teaching uh, at IUPUI. One of the classes I'm teaching that's sort of relevant for us tonight is uh, terrorism and policy. Um, and uh, so th those are some of the, the areas that I've taught. Um, my, I was born in Texas, grew up in California. My undergraduate uh, degree in political science is from the University of Toronto in Canada. And then I have a master's in political science from University of Arizona and a PhD in political science from Rutgers University. Um, and I served in the army in the 1980s back when the Soviet Union existed. Um, and uh, we used to get Soviet threat briefings, which is kind of uh, arcane now, um, although maybe maybe not anymore, maybe doing, going back to the future. Um, I guess that's pretty much uh, what you need to know about me, other than I will say that um, the Great Decisions program is fantastic, and I did some calculation, and this is the 17th year in a row that I've given a talk for the Great Decisions program with ICWA. Um, this is my first year on the board this year. I was on the board like way back like 10, 15 years ago, but um, every single year for 17 years, I've done a talk, a different subject. And several months ago, uh, I agreed with, uh, with, with Betty uh, to go ahead. I picked uh, Biden's foreign policy as the topic many, many months ago, not knowing that we would be dealing with a, a, you know, a, a war in, in Ukraine. I had no idea that was going to happen. So um, what I'm going to do now, share my screen, and I'm going to give a talk, um, of, of kind of a, more of a formal, um, whoops, hang on, let me share my, whoops, uh-oh. Something just weird just happened here. Sorry about that. Okay, hold on. Let me do, I hit the wrong button. Okay, here we go. All righty. Um, oops. And let me just minimize my, what I'm seeing of you guys. Okay. So, um, what, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, Biden's foreign policy and the invasion of Ukraine. We modified the title to take advantage of what's happening right now, which I think is what a lot of you people are, a lot of us are interested in talking about. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover uh, several different topics uh, fairly quickly. Um, first, I want to give an overview of different perspectives on American foreign policy and international relations, realism, idealism, and liberal institutionalism. Uh, maybe for some students, this will be familiar to you, but I think it's kind of important to get an, an idea of some of the basic kind of framework of, of foreign policy and, and international relations. Then I'll move on um, very quickly to uh, 
what President Biden's uh, foreign policy focus was going to be coming into the administration and what he was planning to focus on um, uh, before the invasion of Ukraine, and that was China. And for those of you who have uh, read the Great Decisions book um, with, uh, you know, uh, for, for this, uh, this year, uh, the topic of Biden's foreign policy, uh, it really focuses exclusively on China. Um, and I will refer to some of the stuff that John Eikenberry wrote in the chapter um, for that. Then I will talk about the Russian invasion of Ukraine and get into a little bit of detail on that, including uh, uh, the Biden administration's response. And then I'm gonna conclude with sort of a brief overview of the Geneva Conventions, the law of armed conflict, and raise the question, is Russia committing war crimes in Ukraine by looking at the Geneva Conventions and the law of armed, com law of armed conflict? Um, and so that's how I'll end, and then we'll open it up to questions. So let me go through this. Um, as, uh, as Betty said, I write a column for the uh, uh, Indianapolis Business Journal, and um, my most recent, I do once a month, and my most recent one came out on February 11th. It was before uh, you know, the, the invasion began on the 24th. And so basically my column was uh, why Putin wants, wants Ukraine. That was the focus. And um, I basically made the arguments for why this was going to happen. Um, I was hoping that it would be de-escalated, but I, I pretty much said, I think the invasion will take place and here's why. Um, my next column is actually coming out this Friday and it will be on the invasion of Ukraine um, and talking about what's been happening. Um, and so uh, you can get that on, on the IBJ. Also, if you're interested, you can follow me on Twitter at PR Atlas. So perspectives on American foreign policy, uh, realism, idealism, and liberalism. These are three different approaches um, that uh, we, we look at in international relations. Realism, you may, may be familiar with, it's also known as realpolitik. Realism is the classic original understanding of international relations. It goes back to Machiavelli. It goes back even before that to Hobbes. Um, and, and, and others as well. It focuses on national interests. States or countries must pursue their own self-interest. This is a basic premise of realism. Power enables states to do this. To quote a famous uh, post-World War II uh, international relations theorist who was a realist named Hans Morgenthau, he said, statesmen think and act in terms of interest defined as power. From a realist perspective, their key focus is great power competition and balance of power between the major powers in order to maintain stability in the system. From a realist perspective, sometimes it is necessary to go to war in order to uh, uh, achieve power or to balance out a, a, a different actor. Realists strongly argue that morality should not be a factor in foreign policy. You deal with countries as they are and that is not as how you would like them to be. Realism also looks at what's called geopolitics. And geopolitics looks at a country's geographic position, its size, neighbors, its terrain, its natural resources, all these are critical to a state's power and behavior. And what, what, a, what realists will do, one of the first things they'll do is they'll pull out a map and they'll say, okay, let's take a look at Ukraine or Russia. Who are its neighbors? Who are its enemies? Who are its threats? How much terrain does it have? How much natural resources does it have? These are measurements of power and it'll also give us an understanding of why they behave the way they do. And a realist would say, it doesn't really matter if the country's democratic or authoritarian, um, they'll pretty much behave based on their power position and their interest. An alternative to realism, what's called idealism. And idealism in the American context comes from, it comes out of American exceptionalism. The idea that there's something unique about America and that what is unique, it's about the values. Now, other countries also have idealist, idealism in their foreign policy, but we're really talking about the United States here. So when we're talking about values, we're talking about democracy, equality, human rights, um, uh, values should take precedence over interests. So realism uh, and, and idealism stand as opposites. Um, and they're, they're like two ends of a continuum. Um, as a political scientist, uh, international relations professor, Bruce Gentleson said, uh, looking at, real, at, at idealism, in the long run, right makes for right. Excuse me, right makes for might. In other words, it's better to do what's right. And in the long run, you will actually obtain more power that way. You'll get more soft power. People will follow you if, you're, if they want to follow you because you're, you're leading uh, through, through your values. Lead through your values. Don't just pursue your interests. Woodrow Wilson was one of the most famous uh, idealist foreign policy presidents who famously said, uh, make, the world to, make the world safe for democracy. That, in 1917, is why he said we were entering World War I, to make the world safe for democracy. That is a very idealistic um, perspective. Another approach that also exists in opposition to realism, separate from idealism, is called liberal institutionalism, also known as liberal internationalism. And liberalism uh, basically makes an argument that, yes, states are powerful, power matters, balance of power matters, competition matters, but formal rules, institutions, norms of behavior, cooperation, economic interdependence, respect for human rights, all of these things can constrain 
to states in the international system. It can reduce chances of conflict, and it can also enable states to address global problems. Uh, liberal institutions will say global problems require global solutions. States just pursuing their own national self-interest is not going to be able to address global problems. So realism is juxtaposed against liberal institutionalism in terms of, of their vision of how states ought to behave, but also realism is, is juxtaposed against idealism, especially in an American uh, context. Now, where does this, how does this uh, play itself out? Um, I would argue that American foreign policy from the time of the founding, from the time of the Republic, American foreign policy has always been an admixture of realism and idealism with one uh, being prioritized over the other in a given situation at a given moment in time. Um, there are times when the United States in a, in a situation pursued its interests um, in spite of its values. There are times when maybe we stressed our values over our interests, okay? Um, ideally, American foreign policy is its most powerful and most effective when both national interests and American values are in sync. And frankly, the ideal best example of that is World War II. It was, it was both in America's national self-interest to defeat fascism and free, free countries under occupation, and it was very much consistent with American values. Values and interests were both in sync, so they don't have to be in opposition. Uh, after World War II, the United, the United States played the lead role in designing, building, and leading the post-World War II liberal international order, which was very much founded in the idea of liberal institutionalism. And this had large bipartisan support Different administrations would vary a little bit in terms of how they approached it, but really it was a, for, for the most part, it was a, a largely a bipartisan effort from 1945 on. International institutions and norms of cooperation, interdependence, human rights, free trade, the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, the, the World Bank, the IMF, GATT, which becomes the World Trade Organization, um, uh, the International Convention to Prevention of Genocide, all these different kinds of things. These are all uh, the, uh, the rules of the game. The Geneva Conventions, which I'll be talking about later, the international humanitarian law. This body of institutions, formal rules and informal norms of behavior have sort of set standards and have constrained states from behaving in a particular way. One of the reasons why the international community is so appalled by what Russia is doing is because Russia is blatantly violating all of the basic principles of the liberal international order that has existed since World War II. Um, and and it's a, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, increasingly, uh, over time, the United States led a, a, a more inclusive first world of free market democracies, uh, including the military alliance of NATO, Asian alliances, the United States supported the creation of the European Union. All of these things are coming out of the liberal or, or part of the liberal international order, which you could also make an argument was consistent with American values and also consistent with American interests. So they, they can be uh, in sync. And when they are in sync, they become the most powerful. With some variations, these approaches held across U.S. administrations from 1945 until 2017, I would argue. Um, and again, there are different times. So like there are times when the United States would abandon um, or, or put uh, its values uh, second place over its interests. During the Cold War, for example, um, in order to fight uh, the Soviet Union and communism, the United States sort of put its values to the side and supported a lot of repressive non-democratic regimes because they were anti-communist. That was realism sort of taking the place over, over uh, idealism, for example. But in general, the United States has supported the liberal international order really through 2017. And I would say what changed was President Trump. Um, from 2017 to 21, he upended or at least tried to upend the 70 year history. I would argue that under Trump, the United States was largely not realist. We did not pursue national interests. And we also did not pursue American values, but rather American foreign policy very often became transactional and even personal shaped by Trump's personal interests, prejudice, prejudices, and ego. Um, there were times when, when we abandoned both our interests and our values, I would argue about that, and I've written about that in the past. Um, Trump actively sought to undermine and dismantle the liberal international order. He attacked the United Nations. He attacked other international organizations and international norms. He attacked NATO and sided with Putin openly. He attacked our Asian allies. He withdrew from the Paris Agreement. He rejected the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and he actively sought to dismantle decades of free trade um, and and uh, that the United States had created and to replace it with protectionism and neo-mercantilism. This is the world, um, and this was sort of the international, the liberal international order kind of tottering that President Biden inherits when he becomes president um, in, in January of 2021. So let me move on to that. So when Biden comes in, and now we're going to get into some of the stuff from the Great Decisions book, I'm going to bring in a couple of things here from John Eikenberry. By the way, John Eikenberry is a very respected international relations scholar who is very much of the liberal institutionalist tradition. And if those of you who've, if you've read the chapter, you will really pick that up. He's not a realist, he's a liberal institutionalist. 
or liberal internationalist. Um, from Eikenberry's chapter in the 2022 book, which notably was written in November of 2021. So the chapter that you guys read, for those of you who did read it for the great decisions, um, was written well before uh, Putin invaded Ukraine. So his so Eikenberry's fake focus is, has nothing to do with Russia. Interesting, Russia is not even mentioned really in the chapter, which I think is very interesting. Um, so what does he say? He says, well, the system of rules and institutions built in the decades after 1945 and expanded after the Cold War, after the Soviet Union collapsed, so liberal institutionalism had a second life, is in disarray, he writes in, in November of 2021. Cooperation among the advanced industrial democracies, the G7, has ebbed even in the face of a global pandemic and economic recession. Meanwhile, China is quickly emerging as a global superpower, poised to overtake the United States as the world's largest economy. Under the leadership of President Xi Jinping, China has become a challenge to American leadership and the liberal oriented global order. This is the assessment of Eikenberry in the Great Decisions book. Now, I have a question that maybe we can address our, together in the Q&A, um, and that is, has Russia's invasion of Ukraine and its violation of international rules and norms, along with the swift and strong international relation, the international reaction, altered or, or changed any of Eikenberry's assertions? Um, in other words, has, are we maybe getting, going to see a rebirth or a rejuvenation of the international liberal order of the liberal international order in response to what Russia is doing. Um, that's something maybe to think about. So what, what is Biden's agenda and what was his agenda coming in? And this, by the way, was the title of the Great Decisions Talk program that we planned six months ago, and this was not knowing that Ukraine was going to be the issue. Okay. So what was Biden's agenda, according to Eikenberry, according to the chapter? Um, his primary po foreign policy focus coming into uh, the administration in the, into the uh, 2021 was China. Um, and I'm directly quoting here. Um, the Biden administration is giving shape to a grand strategy of strategic competition with China. It begins with the conviction that China is increasingly a full spectrum challenger to the United States, to our global position and to the US led liberal democratic world. A full spectrum challenger, challenging the United States on all fronts. Russia is not a full spectrum challenger. Russia is, is a second rate economy with the world's largest nuclear arsenal. And frankly, an army that doesn't fight very well is what we're seeing right now um, against, against another army. China, on the other hand, is a full spectrum challenger. Eikenberry goes on. The US and China are hegemonic rivals with very different visions of world order. The United States wants to make the world safe for democracy. And China wants to make the world safe for the Chinese Communist Party and political autocracy. And this is coming from Eikenberry, who himself is a liberal institutionalist. Quoting again, the Biden administration has thus moved to place long-term strategic competition with China at the center of its foreign policy. The, this, was, this was how Biden envisioned what the American foreign policy agenda was going to be. It was going to be full long-term strategic competition with China. That was going to affect both our domestic policy to make America better at, at democracy, to build our infrastructure, to deal with a lot of internal problems so we could better deal with China, but also strategically, also in terms of international cooperation. At the same time, what's very interesting is Biden does understand, and this is, this is Eikenberry again, he understands that the United States will need to build working relations with China, even as it competes. And this is again quoting Eikenberry. There are critical and growing problems of interdependence that can only be tackled through superpower cooperation. And one of the top ones is climate change. So here it is, here you have the liberalism and the idealism of America standing for its values, but at the same time, we're putting on our realist hat and saying, you know what? We still have to deal with China. We have to cooperate with China, despite what it's doing to the Uyghurs, despite um, all the other kinds of things that's going on. We have to deal with it in a realist perspective at the same time that we also have to keep our values and, and try and, and realize that they're challenging the liberal international order and we have to do something about that. This is sort of the, uh, the understanding of, uh, of Biden's uh, foreign policy. Um, a couple of things that I wanna bring in and now we're moving past Eikenberry. From today's daily chatter, and I'll, I'll echo um, uh, Betty's uh, uh, plea to join the Indiana Council on World Affairs. If you are a member of the ICWA, you get the daily chatter free in your, in your email every single day. And these are a couple of stories that popped into my email this morning. And I said, hey, I wanna bring these into the talk. First, uh, South Korea is having their elections tomorrow, um, Democratic South Korea. And uh, a survey was taken by um, the Chicago Council on World Affairs um, and uh, about, wh about what do South Koreans think about nuclear weapons? And this was taken before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So actually, if anything, the numbers might even be stronger, but this is very interesting. 71% of South Koreans support South Korea developing its own nuclear weapons. 56% support the deployment of US nuclear weapons in South Korea. This is to deter China 
and also North Korea. And then they also noted, this is interesting too, that um, oh, the, the South Koreans overwhelmingly would prefer having an independent nuclear arsenal over an American deployment, okay? Um, and only 40% uh, uh, opposed deployment uh, of American, uh, American nuclear weapons, but only 26% of Koreans opposed a domestic nuclear arsenal. So uh, the majority of South Koreans are now saying that they think, or they would support South Korea having its own nuclear weapons to deter China and to, to, to deter um, North Korea. This also, by the way, focuses, focuses in on the question or the point about just how China is a, uh, is a challenger, not just the United States, but throughout all of Asia. The second point from today's uh, daily chatter I wanted to bring in was an article from the Wall Street Journal that they cited um, about Australia has now announced they're building a new naval base on the east coast of Australia that can uh, for, for, sub, for submarines. Australia, Australia just signed a deal with the US and Britain, you might know about this, to acquire their own nuclear powered submarines. But this new base will also be able to support American nuclear, nuclear missile submarines. So the, the United States could have a, a submarine base in Australia, which could also help deter China and have, have more presence in Asia. So these are all kinds of things that are happening. There's nothing to do with Ukraine, although it could very well be that um, uh, South, Korea may, South Koreans may want even more of a nuclear deterrence given uh, the, what's happening in Ukraine, because that might potentially encourage China to do more stuff. We can talk about that during the Q&A. Um, and by the way, the prime minister of Australia, he was quoted as saying, this base will enhance our strategic deterrent capability. So uh, it's not just the United States that's thinking this way. Uh, South Korea, um, Australia, Japan, other countries as well. Um, a couple more points on, on related to uh, China and Asia that I wanted to sort of bring in. These are my own uh, points. First of all, it's important to understand the United States has been a Pacific power since the late 19th century. Um, and the United States has, uh, that's a long time, 150 years, we have been a Pacific oriented power, not just Atlantic. And in fact, the United States, whereas the United States generally wanted to stay out of European wars and we got sort of dragged in in World War I and World War II, the United States was much more aggressive in the Pacific um, for a very long time. President Biden uh, wanted to return to what Obama tried to do at the end of his administration, which was the pivot to China. Um, Obama wanted to get out of the wars in the Middle East because he understood China was the bigger, bigger issue. Obama had the same attitude, and that's one of the major reasons why Obama wanted, excuse me, Biden had the same uh, attitude, and that's one of the major reasons why Biden wanted to get out of Afghanistan. It wasn't just because Afghanistan wasn't a winnable war. He wanted to be able to refocus our attention on China, not knowing what was going to happen with Ukraine. A couple of quick points on Taiwan that I want to make. Um, China is watching what Russia, the global community, and the Ukrainians are doing in the current crisis. In terms of how Russia is able to do what it's doing, will Russia be able to get away with it? Will the global community, uh, how strong will it uh, stop Russia from doing what it's doing? How strong is the reaction going to be? And how are the Ukrainians fighting? All of these things may factor in to how China looks at Taiwan. Um, we will, will the Taiwanese fight as hard as the Ukrainians if they're invaded? Um, will China be able to do better than Russia in a military operation? Will the international community crack down on China the way they track, crack down on Russia? These are things that I'm sure that are going through the minds of, of Chinese leaders right now. Japan and South Korea are also very uh, closely watching what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, because again, it's the, the, this could affect their neighborhood um, in, in a kind of a parallel situation. I would also point out that um, the United States has stronger and more historic ties and commitments to a democratic Taiwan than it does to a democratic Ukraine. Um, the United States has a much longer relationship with Taiwan. Taiwan has been democratic longer, um, frankly, since the 1980s than Ukraine has been. Um, the United States has a strong military relationship with Taiwan. On the other hand, Taiwan is not a sovereign state recognized as such in the international community, and Ukraine is. So uh, this is some interesting uh, differences that we can maybe talk about in the Q&A. Um, I want to pick up a little bit on the, uh, move on to the next point. Um, so that's basically what I wanted to say about what Eikenberry and China and, and Biden's agenda related to China and Asia. Let's talk a little bit about the invasion of Ukraine. Um, what, did, what did the Biden administration do? Well, from the very beginning, when things were, were uh, building up in, in February, in early February, um, prior to the invasion, one of the things that the Biden administration did, which I think it really deserves a lot of credit for, is it, um, it publicized on a daily basis U.S. intelligence of what the Russians were doing. Interestingly enough, not a lot of people believed what the United States was saying. They thought, oh, the Russians aren't really going to do this. It's just, um, it's just symbolic. Um, frankly, the Ukrainians didn't believe Russia was going to attack. But pretty much everything that the United States said the Russians were doing 
the Russians ended up actually doing. Uh, all of the intelligence reports were, were, were pretty much dead on in terms of what, what, what they were saying, the kind of rationale they were, they were saying, the kind of fake news they were going to present as, as a, as a so-called uh, justification for the invasion, all these kinds of things. Biden, basically, every time the Russians did a move, the Biden administration did a counter move by releasing uh, intelligence to sort of expose what the Russians were doing. Did it stop Putin from doing what, was, what he was going to do? No, but it made it more difficult for him to get away with it once he started. The United States threatened sanctions uh, if Russia moved into Ukraine, and those sanctions were supposed to be a deterrence. They did not deter Putin, and frankly, I don't think anything would have deterred Putin, and we can talk about that later in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, uh, Biden worked very closely with NATO and the European Union, um, it, it shored up the relationship that Trump had basically almost severed um, when he was president, and, and the U.S., the NATO, and the European Union very quickly have been able to ratchet up sanctions, international and American sanctions, and in sync, have, having them in sync. It's very important. Sanctions really only work if everybody's on the same page. Um, and and uh, Biden and NATO and the European Union have been working very closely to do this in a fairly impressive way. I think history is going to look back on this and say this was actually um, foreign policy working pretty well in, in response to what the Russians were doing. Within a matter of days, Russia was more globally isolated than ever before in its history. Its economy is being devastated. During the, during the Cold War, and we watched all these video clips on the Cold War, the Soviet Union was not isolated. The Soviet Union had the entire second world of the communist bloc on its side, and it had much of the third world on its side as well. The Soviet Union was not isolated. Russia today has never been this isolated, maybe in a, in a thousand years. Um, Biden took the case to the UN Security Council and to the UN General Assembly. Um, uh, there was a rapid, there's been a rapid increase in lethal arms to Ukraine, especially Javelin anti-tank missiles. Um, in, in, in the last uh, nine or 10 days, the US, uh, the New York Times reported a couple of days ago, I think in a matter of about five days, the United States delivered 17,000 Javelin missiles uh, and other weapons to Ukraine to be used in the field. Um, and as of today, as you probably all know, uh, President Biden announced uh, this morning um, that uh, the United States is banning the importation of Russian oil and gas into the United States. And we'll see what happens with, with, uh, with other countries. And we certainly can talk about that in the Q&A and what the downsides might be of that. What more could or should be done? Well, one thing that is sort of being talked about um, is having uh, the former Warsaw Pact communist bloc states who are now members of NATO, namely Poland and Romania, um, handing over their, their uh, MiG uh, fighters, their Russian fighters, to Ukraine, where the Ukrainians know how to fly them, with the United States uh, backfilling those, those planes with American fighters. That's a possibility. And then allow the Ukrainians to have aircraft to perhaps try and impose their own no-fly zone. That's another thing we can talk about if you're interested. One final point about here that needs to be understood, and that is foreign policy is always influenced by domestic politics, always, in every case. And so what are some of the major domestic issues happening now that are going to influence American foreign policy? Well, there are a couple of things that, that are immediately come to mind. One is inflation, including gas prices, and the other is the no November midterm elections coming up. And everything that the administration is doing everything that the Republicans are doing either to support or oppose. Uh, there's that domestic policy lens that is uh, definitely uh, clouding or impacting on what America is going to do in terms of foreign policy. That's always the case, and it's something that we need to keep in mind. Um, some observations about, the, about Putin's actions I want to sort of make, and then I'll move on to the final part. Um, I would argue uh, that Putin's actions have actually undermined one of his primary long-term strategic goals. And what is that? To divide the European and NATO and to distance the United States from the Atlantic Alliance. This is what he's been trying to do for the past 20 years, to divide up NATO, to split it up, to get the, United, the Europeans and the Americans separate from each other. He had a lot of help with Donald Trump in trying to do that, because Donald Trump was trying to do that himself. Okay, But what happened instead? This backfired. Um, instead, the, the, the callous and unrestrained war that he is waging in Ukraine, his open attack on the norms of state sovereignty, and his attack on the 70-year-old liberal international order, all of these have isolated Russia and have unified most of the democratic world against it. With notable exceptions, uh, India and South Africa are sort of being neutral on this, but pretty much the rest of the democratic world is, on this, is, is against Russia, and NATO is fully, is, is fully um, uh, mobilized in ways it hasn't been in decades. Um, I would say that Putin is sort of eliminating the gray, the gray areas within Europe. What do I mean by that? Well, within just a matter of days, Germany not only canceled Nord Stream 2, which was going to be this major pipeline to bring uh, uh, natural gas into Germany, but it reversed 15 years of defense policy and declared it's going to double its defense spending within a matter of days. And this is a German coalition government that includes the Greens, and they are supporting defending, doubling their defense spending. Uh, Germany is going to be spending more money on defense into the future, possibly, than Russia is. 
European countries traditionally on the fence when it comes to Russia, namely Sweden and Finland, are now uh, talking about moving closer to NATO and perhaps even joining NATO. For the first time ever, a couple of days ago, uh, more than 50% of Swedes said they support joining NATO. Both Sweden and Finland are members of the European Union, but they're not members of NATO. For the first time ever, because of Russia's invasion, the majority of Swedes are saying we should join NATO. And the president of Finland, uh, who just met with Biden a few days ago, um, has suggested that maybe, maybe Finland ought to join NATO too. And of course, that's right on the border with Russia. This is the exact opposite of what Putin wanted, but this is Putin's own doing. And then finally, Putin had made this argument that by going into, you know, he's going to save the, the Russian-speaking Ukrainians in eastern Ukraine. These are ethnically Russian. Um, they, you know, we're, we're saving them. That it should be its own place. And what has he found out? The majority of Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine are opposing the invasion. They're standing up to him. They're risking their lives to, to do it. And even though they may be Russian speakers as first language, they are opposing Putin as Ukrainians. He's actually unifying Ukraine in ways that it might not have been unified before. So everything, everything that he's doing is backfiring in terms of what was his grand strategy uh, for Europe, which I think is very interesting. We'll see what happens as we move forward. Something else we can talk about. Okay, the last thing I wanna cover, and then I will go to Q&A, is I wanna talk very briefly about the Geneva Conventions, um, international humanitarian law, which also is, is the source of the law of armed conflict. And the thing I'm gonna ask basically is, is Russia committing war crimes in Ukraine? Well, we begin with the 1949 Geneva Conventions and international humanitarian law. And what I wanna do is I'm gonna, I wanna show you a three minute video. So I'm gonna back out of this and then share a different screen. This is, this is a video from the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, which is the official um, monitor and enforcer of the Geneva Conventions. Okay, they're based in Geneva, the ICRC. As you watch this three minute video talking about international humanitarian law, think Russia and ask yourself, is Russia doing what they're supposed to do according to international humanitarian law, okay? So let me um, back out of this. Let me go to this and this should work. When wars happen, international humanitarian law sets out agreed rules for how they are to be conducted. We don't see the video. States develop these rules to protect the civilian- Oh, shoot, you don't see it? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. You know what, I did the wrong thing. Okay, I apologize. I didn't back out. <laughs> okay, let me, let me do it again. I apologize. Hold on a second. Um, I thought I did what I did, but I didn't. Okay. Do you see it now? Yes. Okay. When wars happen, international humanitarian law sets out agreed rules for how they are to be conducted. States develop these rules to protect the civilian population from the effects of hostilities. These rules outline what targets may be legally attacked and how, based on a careful balance between military necessity and humanity. Like all of IHL, they apply regardless of the reasons for fighting. The three main principles are distinction, proportionality, and precautions. The principle of distinction requires parties to armed conflicts to distinguish at all times between the civilian population and combatants and between civilian objects and military objectives. Attacks against military objectives, including combatants, are not prohibited. In contrast, the civilian population, individual civilians, and civilian objects must never be attacked. Direct attacks against them are prohibited, as are indiscriminate attacks. That is, attacks that by their nature strike military objectives and civilians or civilian objects without distinction. Under the principle of proportionality, attacks against military objectives are prohibited if such attacks may be expected to cause incidental loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, damage to civilian objects, or a combination of these, which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. In simple terms, this means that a military objective may only be attacked if the potential accompanying civilian losses are not expected to outweigh the foreseen military advantage. The principle of precautions requires that, in the conduct of military operations, constant care must be taken to spare the civilian population, civilians, and civilian objects. In attack, so-called active precautions include doing everything feasible to verify that targets are indeed military objectives, cancelling or suspending an attack if it becomes apparent that the target is not a military objective, and giving effective advance warning of attacks, which may affect the civilian population, unless circumstances do not permit. 
So-called passive precautions require taking all feasible steps to protect the civilian population and civilian objects under one's control against the effects of attacks. The principles of distinction, proportionality, and precautions are complementary, and all three must be respected for an attack to be lawful. Distinction, proportionality, and precautions, like IHL in general, do not stop wars from happening. But these three principles work together as a tool to limit suffering and destruction. By outlining rules for the conduct of hostilities, it is possible for international humanitarian law to prevent, or at least reduce, war's most devastating effects. Okay, now let me go back to the other one. Continue with my... Okay, now obviously, um, not you know, not all countries follow international humanitarian law. The United States has done things that it clearly have violated some of those. The question about the Russians, though, are they doing this deliberately? It's one thing to inadvertently, um, you know, hit civilians. The United States has the, the euphemism of collateral damage. Um, I think we can say, and we'll talk about this later on, that the uh, the Russians are are doing intentional. Um, it's not it's not collateral civilian damage. It's, it's deliberate civilian damage. And deliberate deliberate civilian targets. But let's move on and get back into this. So, out of, out of international humanitarian law comes the law of armed conflict, the LOIC. There are four basic principles. You, I'm not in great detail, but distinction, which is the same thing they were talking about before, distinguishing between combatants and non-combatants, civ civilian population, things like that. Proportionality, again, is the, it cannot be an, a, a excessive. Military necessity, everything done to the enemy, um, it must be absolutely necessary, and anything beyond that is criminal. Unnecessary suffering, it's prohibited to employ weapons, projectiles, materials, and methods of warfare of a nature to cause superfluous injury, unnecessary suffering. These are basic, basic principles of the law of armed conflict. And then this gets translated into a, a simple card um, that fits in the size of your, that fits in your shirt pocket that every American soldier is issued. And it's called an ROE card, a rules of engagement card. And I wanna show you this and just talk about this very, very briefly. Um, and, then I, and then I'll have my concluding comments. Okay, whoops, I didn't wanna get there. So this is a, this is a standard US Army ROE card. Um, a particular missions on a particular operation, you'd get it more, more custom tailored for that particular mission. But let me just kind of go through a couple of these. I don't know to what extent you can see it on your computer. Um, it says, uh, uh, all enemy personnel and vehicles transporting the enemy or their supplies may be engaged subject to the following restrictions. These are restrictions. Um, and I'm not going to go through everyone, but I'm going to read a few. A, when possible, the enemy will be warned first and asked to surrender. By the way, keep in mind, uh, think about the Russians, right? Armed force is the last resort. Armed civilians will be engaged only in self-defense. Civilian aircraft will not be engaged without approval from division level except in self-defense. Let me jump a few other here. Um, if civilians are in the air, this is F. If civilians are in the area, artillery, mortars, armed helicopters, AC-130, tube launch, rocket launch weapons, and tank main guns should not be used against known or subject, subse, suspected targets without the permission of a ground maneuver commander, lieutenant colonel or higher. If civilians are in the area, all air attacks must be controlled by a forward air controller. If civilians are in the area, close air support, white phosphorus weapons and incendiary weapons are prohibited without approval from a division level. In other words, you just can't do it on your own. You have to have much higher approval to do that. And usually they may or may, may not say yes. Um, moving on, public works such as power stations, water treatment plants, dams, and other utilities may not be engaged without approval from division level. Hospitals, churches, shrines, schools, museums, and other historical or cultural sites will be engaged only in self-defense against fire from these locations. Um, and then it goes on and on. Booby traps are unauthorized. Civilian property may not be harmed unless necessary to save US lives. Uh, all civilians and their property should be treated with respect and dignity. Privately owned property may not may be used only if publicly owned property is unavailable and appropriate. Um, and then it goes on and on. Okay, so this is basically your standard rules of engagement for an American soldier. Again, I'm not saying that, that this is perfectly followed, but the bottom line is I would suggest that this actually acts as a reverse checklist of what the Russians are intentionally not doing, what they're deliberately not doing in Ukraine. They are violating everything here and they're doing it deliberately. So are these war crimes? In my view, they are. Um, and, and I'm gonna end on that note. So uh, I'm gonna back out. And um, this, is, this is sort of my formal presentation. And um, I, I've got a map here we can come back to, but I'm gonna stop sharing at this point.
And I am happy to, we have actually, I, I took a lot less than I thought I would. We have quite a bit of time for uh, questions and discussion. So I'm happy to just, uh, we can go into some of the stuff that I said, things, uh, things I didn't talk about, whatever you'd like. Um, let's just have a conversation. And I, I know I, it's, it's gonna be, I know you guys are gonna be directing the questions to me and then I'll respond to the questions. Hey, hey Pierre, I, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so we're, the way we're gonna work this tonight is that we'll have some questions from our um, regular audience and also from the uh, Purdue classroom. So Betty, are you uh, ready? Do you have a student have a question to start with? Oh, they're gonna come on up. Yes, they'll be coming up right now. I'm gonna ask the students just come on <coughs> down. Um, well, we'll just do one at a time, Betty. And then yes, we'll... yes, but I mean, I, I don't want them to be shy about coming down. Okay. No, we know students are not shy. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Hello, my name is Grace Brooks. Uh, I'm a senior at Purdue University studying social studies education. Uh, thank you for this talk. I really, um, it was very informative for one thing. I also um, enjoyed hearing about it. I've always had an interest in foreign policy. Um, so my question to you is what, how much of a role do you think that environmental policy, because you talked about how domestic policy plays a role in the foreign policy. How much do you think environmental policy in particular has played a role in what's been happening in Russia and Ukraine? Um, for example, Europe gets, I think, 45% of their oil from Russia, um, not to mention like the, the cancellation of the Keystone, Keystone Pipeline. How, um, how much do you think that plays a role in what's been happening in Ukraine? That's a really good question. And um, I will uh, answer that, I think, from the Ameri uh, US policy perspective as well. First of all, let me just say, uh, uh, my son is not in the audience, but he is a junior at Purdue in uh, biomedical engineering. Um, and uh, I don't, I think he's studying for a test, so he's not there. But um, <laughs> he better be anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, first of all, uh, clearly uh, the Russians don't seem to care very much about environmental policy, given the fact that they were firing on a nuclear reactor um, and, and, and they may be doing more of those as well. So let's set that to the side. Um, what's interesting, remember I, I said that foreign policy is always influenced by domestic politics. And you have a bipartisan coalition in the United States um, for the ban on the importation of Russian oil and gas. And, uh, some, and it's coming out of interests and values. Um, some of it is, you know, we have to do things, we have to hit the Russians harder. Um, Russia uh, is largely dependent on, the main source of its, of its national income is oil and gas. Um, John McCain famously said in 2015 um, that Russia is a gas station masquerading as a country. Um, and that basically if you shut off the gas, it will, it, it will, it will, the country will shut down, okay? So there's a lot of people in both the Republicans and Democratic side who very much want um, to do it for you know, values, uh, you know, uh, American values, the, the, what they're doing to Ukraine. But there's also people uh, who normally wouldn't support President Biden on anything um, who are also supporting this. Because what they want is by cutting off the, uh, the and we don't get, we only get maybe four or 5% of our oil from Russia, okay? And right now the United States is the largest oil producer in the world, second to Saudi, uh, sec, after, uh, excuse me, U US is number one, Saudi Arabia is number two. Um, but there are people who want the United States to be producing more oil. So there's gonna be pressure on Biden coming from Republicans to actually open up uh, more, more drilling sites, more drilling locations, because they want more oil, they want more fossil fuels. They want, and so, so it's gonna be an interesting thing because it, now Biden's gonna have to balance um, a very strong support for dealing with climate change, which is a major issue for him and for Harris and for the Democrats. And Biden sees it as, I didn't mention climate change really, but he really sees it as an existential issue for the world. Um, but at the same time, the United States, so that there's that one set of issues. On the other hand, the United States wants to isolate Russia. We want to hit them hard. And the hardest way to hit Russia is oil and gas. But in order to do that, we also have to worry about the price of, of gas in the United States, which is already going through the roof. And, and we have to supplement the missing Russian gas, and uh, oil and gas, with other sources. And so there's going to be people who want it to be coming from the United States. So there's going to be a potentially a negative environmental impact uh, in the United States from that in order for us to hit Russia. So it's, this is sort of a, a juggling act between all these different uh, interests um, that are conflicting with each other. Um, but it also leads to sort of like the politics of strange bedfellows, which is again, one reason why you're gonna see uh, some Republicans who otherwise wouldn't support Biden are saying, yeah, but now what we want you to do is, you know, maybe open up the Keystone XL pipeline or may maybe go ahead and do this. We need to get more oil coming from Canada. We need to open up more drilling. We need to have Arctic drilling. We need to offshore drilling. We need to supplement all this kind of stuff so that the United States is more energy independent. Um, and immediately, 
and renewables are not going to give us immediate sources of, of energy. Oil can be much more immediate. And so that's part of what, what's going to happen. I don't know if that addresses the question you had, but that's sort of, that's how I would sort of take it. Yeah. Yeah. You addressed it perfectly. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, we got a question here from uh, Bob Mack. Uh, what would happen if we actually uh, silted the transfer of these uh, fighter planes to Ukraine? Uh, is this risking escalating the uh, involvement of the United States in this conflict? So, the United—I mean, the United States is already providing a lot of weapons to Ukraine. I mean, we're we're giving them right now the deadliest weapon Ukraine has is is a Javelin uh, anti-tank missile, and we're giving them thousands of those. All right. Um, so at that level, uh, th we're already doing that. The idea of giving uh, Russian, like uh, you know, Russian-built MiG-29s that that belong to Poland or Romania, having them give them to the Ukrainians, is to let the Ukrainians do the the, the fighting in the air themselves, just like the Ukrainians are doing the javelin, using the javelins themselves. They're not using American troops. The danger is, in my opinion, the danger is not so much the weapons going from from Poland to uh, Ukraine. The real danger would be if NATO and the United, and including the United States and other NATO countries were to actually try and impose their own no-fly zone, which is one reason why nobody wants to do this. I mean, you've had like Adam Kinzinger, who I otherwise have a lot of respect for, and I know he was an Air Force uh, pilot himself, but he's one of the few Americans calling for a no-fly zone um, that NATO should do. But that would actually put uh, uh, US and NATO uh, aircraft in direct uh, combat, potentially with Russian aircraft, and that would really dangerously escalate the conflict. Um, so the idea of giving Russian jets uh, to Ukraine from former communist bloc NATO members um, is a way of sort of getting around that. Now, how will the Russians react? Well, the, I mean, Putin has been saying that whatever we do is an act of war. I mean, he's saying the economic sanctions are an act of war. So basically what he is saying is you, anything you do to me to, to hurt me, I'm going to call an act of war no matter what. So uh, what we need to do is avoid direct combat between, between our countries and Russia. That's, that's really important to avoid the direct combat. But I really think if, if, uh, if the aircraft go over um, and, they're, and they're used, uh, that's, that's not gonna be the same kind of thing. I think it's gonna be more like in line with the javelins. But there are other issues too. I mean, just because we just, even, even if uh, the air, airplanes are transferred over, um, do the Ukrainians have, uh, have, do they have control over Air Force bases that are large enough to actually uh, operate those jets? Um, will they be able to actually do anything? I mean, there's a lot of other questions that, uh, it, this is not a magic bullet, um, but it, it certainly makes more sense than actually having uh, NATO uh, fly uh, combat missions over Ukraine. And that's, that's a non-starter. Nobody, no, no NATO country is willing to do that, including the United States. All right, thank you. Uh, Betty, is there another question from a student there? Yes. Hello, my name is Chad. Uh, thank you for your talk so far. I was wondering if you could talk on uh, what you think about the effectiveness of these indiscriminate sanctions on authoritarian regimes, um, both in general and, you know, uh, Russia as a case study right now. So uh, sanctions, uh, the, the record of sanctions working is not very good. Um, in general. Um, the main reason uh, sanctions don't work very well is because you don't, you don't get a lot of buy-in. Okay, so sanctions are, are only really effective if everybody's in on it. The one case where sanctions truly worked was in apartheid South Africa, but there are specific characteristics about that. First of all, although apartheid South Africa was not a democracy, for the whites of apartheid South Africa, it was a democracy. And so the pain that they were suffering led to uh, changes within their government and a lot of pressure from other, from other people because the government, the, the apartheid regime was accountable to the white voters. And so the, the sanctions there it basically uh, caused enough pain that it basically led uh, the, the leadership in South Africa to realize we're gonna have to start, start changing in order, in order to survive. And they were surrounded, but the entire world was in on this. It took a long time, by the way, it took years. Um, especially for the United States to come on board. It, took, it, it, was, it was many, many years before the sanctions got to the point where they worked. Um, when you're imposing sanctions on an authoritarian regime, um, it's, it's, a, it's not as successful. And, and again, I'm only saying South Africa, apartheid South Africa was only democratic for the white people that could vote, nobody else, the, minor, the white minority, okay? But that was enough to actually get them to change their policy. But sanctions against an authoritarian regime, a classic example is, is uh, sanctions against Saddam Hussein. Um, frankly, the general, generally, the sanctions uh, end up hurting um, uh, the, or the ordinary people more so than the government. 
but they were not very well designed um, and, and they, they're usually able to survive. And if an, an authoritarian regime by definition is not accountable to their own people. So if the people are demanding change and the government's not accountable, what do they care, right? What's interesting about the sanctions against Russia though, is that they are much more targeted, they're deeper um, and they are, they're swift. And, and they're, 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 there's the level and the depth and the breadth of sanctions uh, imposed on Russia are historically unprecedented. I and mean, we've never seen anything like this. Um, Switzerland is no longer neutral, okay? <laughs> All right, I mean, it, it, and they're, they're going after the oligarchs, they're going out, they're now you know, potentially after the oil. I mean, it, it is so, our, our past understanding of how sanctions work and how they don't work, we almost have to sort of set it aside and see what's gonna happen here because this is like a really truly new sanctions regime with a tremendous amount of buy-in. And what's gonna be interesting to see to keep an eye on is what does China do? To what extent will China um, try and become a safety valve for the Russians? Or to what extent will they say, wait a minute, you know, this is so bad, um, uh, it, it's actually damaging our image um, by, by being associated. And maybe we need to get on the side of the rest of the world um, and, and do this, right? Um, I would like to see India get involved. India is the most populous democracy in the world. I'm disappointed that they're not. I'm disappointed that South Africa also uh, did not, they, they both abstained in the UN General Assembly resolution, but you had 143 members of the United Nations voting to condemn Russia and call on them to withdraw. And that was the first emergency session of the General Assembly since 1982, I believe. And 143 countries voted against Russia. Only four countries voted with Russia, Belarus, Syria, North Korea, and Eritrea. What a, what a great comment, what a great bunch of friends. And 34 countries, including uh, China and India and South Africa and others uh, abstained. Okay, so that's sort of like a, a nice test of basically the international community. Russia is totally isolated and it's going to get worse, especially as they, as they do more stuff. You know, there's 2 million refugees right now. Um, by next week, it might be 3 million. In a few weeks, it might be 5 million. Um, this is the, the quickest moving refugee crisis in the, in the history of the world, probably, um, at least in, in recorded history. Um, and uh, it's untenable. And so I, I think uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with the sanctions, but I think it's, it's a unique case and it, it, we'll see what happens. Um, but it's backing Russia into a corner and Putin may double down um, and, and do something really, really uh, dumb, you know, um, so whether, whether it'll work on him or not, but he's not accountable to anybody um, so far anyway, so far. Thank you. Sure. When you, when you talk about it, possible escalation, we have a question here from Adrian. She wants to know about the possibility of Putin deploying nuclear weapons. And as kind of a follow up to that, and given the uh, Geneva Convention issues we spoke about earlier, is it ever possible to use a nuclear weapon and not have it violate those principles? That, well, I think that, I think, um, frankly, uh, the way, uh, let me answer the second question first. Um, if you had a, and I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on nuclear weapons or nuclear warfare, but if you had a very small tactical nuclear weapon that was aimed at, at, in an empty area and only at a military target, um, and basically that's all it hit, um, it, potentially it might not violate it. But otherwise, it, it's the radiation, um, the fact that, it, that it's, a, uh, it's not a smart weapon, um, that, that it causes so much destruction. I don't see how, frankly, it could um, uh, do that. Now, interestingly enough, I'm going to ask you to remind me of the, sec the first question in a second. First part was, you know, uh, yeah. as Putin becomes backed into a corner. Oh, yeah, will, will, will it deploy nukes? Okay. Well, let, me just, let me just go back to uh, make a note of that. Let me, let me just say something else in response to that second question. And I was actually talking to my, uh, my class my terrorism class about this today. And then I gave a guest lecture at a, for another, a friend's a history class on just war theory um, the other day. Um, so a principle, a fundamental principle of, of, of uh, the, the law of war of international humanitarian law is distinction between civilians and, non, and, and combatants and non-combatants. And obviously that the big question is, can nuclear weapons make that distinction? And the answer really is no. Um, but if you go back to the cold war and think about like the, the videos you guys were watching beforehand, from the late 1960s, really in the 1970s on, um, the main uh, focus of, of nuclear uh, deterrence in the Cold War was mutually assured destruction, also known as counterpopulation targeting. And basically what happened was the United States and the Soviet Union made an agreement. They understood that we would not be able to, it was not, it, we could not risk firing nuclear weapons at military targets on the other side because a lot of them were too hardened or they like the missile silos or the submarines were not reachable. So the only way to actually make it so that to deter us from firing nukes at each other was to target our cities. 
And so they basically had an ABM treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 1972. Both countries agreed not to, to basically make their cities naked and to aim our ICBMs at each other's cities. Counterpopulation targeting, also known as MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. That was a complete violation of the law of war, complete violation of just war doctrine, complete violation of proportionality. Um, it was uh, ca uh, Catholic theologians who, who have been talking about just war theory for a thousand years were saying this is fundamentally immoral, but it worked. For 40 years, there was no thermonuclear war between the United States and Soviet Union because we had missiles aimed at each other's cities. So it raises some interesting questions about, the, about morality. Um, which, which is the greater morality? Is the morality um, not, not, not killing each other, not, uh, not killing civilians, or is the greater morality saving the world by aiming your missiles at each other's cities? Um, that's sort of a, an aside thing, but I just wanted to sort of bring that up. It led to some interesting discussions in my class. Going back to the idea of, of Putin um, deploying, he said a very unusual thing a few days ago, which was we're putting our, 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 our nuclear forces on, on, on alert, or on, on some type of a, a military alert. Um, everything that I've read and everything I've, I've heard, and I don't have access to any kind of, I, I mean, I just have, I'm a layman. I only have the access to publicly available information, but everything that I've seen suggests that the Russians have not altered any of their actual deployments of nuclear weapons. That so far has just been words from Putin, okay? Um, now, uh, if he gets back into a corner, um, and, and his military, uh, clearly we are seeing that soldier for soldier, the Russians are no match for the Ukrainians. The Russian soldiers are performing incredibly badly um, across the board. They're, 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 they're doing badly. They, they have more force. They're, they're willing, and because they're doing so badly, um, they are taking out their frustration and they're using, and strategically they're targeting civilians. So they're bombarding civilians, okay? What happens if that doesn't work? What happens if the sanctions gets worse? Will again? Will Will Putin do something? Um, I I th this is like in the total realm of speculation. Who knows who can get into his head? But I would say two things: the potential of him using a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine that could be there, not ICBMs against the United States or something like that. There's a potential for that that he may order it. The real question will be if he does that, what will be the command and control of his nuclear weapons? Will his generals? and the colonels and the lieutenants below him, the people who would actually have to fire the missile, um, will, they, will they obey those orders? Or will they say, wait a minute, Putin, you've gone crazy. Um, I mean, how much command and control is there over the nuclear weapons right now? Um, and that, that's a real question. I don't mean to scare anybody, but they're, you know, we really don't know what, what's gonna happen. Um, but there's a potential that he, I mean, you know, he's already used a thermobaric bomb, which is like a, 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 a air fuel uh, explosion ab above ground. That's, that's uh, potentially a war crime. Um, he's used that on a civilian city, not a civilian target. He hasn't done a lot of it. I mean, he did it early on. He may do those again. Um, he has a lot of other types of weapons that are that are sort of non-conventional weapons that he might use. Um, but so th th that's that's a potential thing. We have to be take it very seriously. But I will say, what's very good from the American perspective is the United States has not responded tit for tat. The United States rhetorically did not match his rhetoric of of talking about nuclear weapons. We have not in, it, uh, changed our DEFCON condition. We have not done any of that. We are signaling to the Russians, we are, we are fine. We're not reacting to you. Uh, so far, they're just words. Let's keep it that way. But as he keeps losing, um, and if, if killing more civilians and creating millions of more refugees isn't going to get him Ukraine, and frankly, it's not, um, what's he going to do? Don't know. Okay. Betty, you got a, another question there from a student? Yes. Someone's coming. Shall we write down? <laughs> Hi, I just had a quick question. So you briefly went over uh, the importance between Taiwan to the US and Ukraine to the US. And I went to a Purdue uh, panel where they talked about Ukraine and they mentioned the fact that Ukraine isn't really high on the US important list when it comes to foreign policy. So do you think that will affect whether or not the US becomes involved or will other effects like you know the possibility of Russia using nuclear weapons will be more important than Ukraine itself? Um, I'm going to actually kind of respond at first with a question. Um, what did the person mean by saying that, that Ukraine is not that important to the United States? I mean, do you remember what the context of that was? Yeah, so basically, um, regardless of, you know, this whole Ukraine conflict, uh, when we think about Ukraine, there, isn't, there really isn't too many resources or um, too much reason for the U.S. to want to, you know, keep control over Ukraine. 
as as there is in Taiwan or say the Middle East with the whole oil situation. Okay, well, I would, uh, I, I, the person who said that at that panel or whatever, um, I would probably push back on a little bit. Um, okay. First of all, Ukraine um, is it's known as the breadbasket of, of uh, it's one of the breadbaskets of Europe. I mean, it's a tremendous uh, wheat producing um, uh, country to the point where if they cannot actually um, uh, process their wheat uh, this season, um, you may actually have uh, the, uh, the uh, bread, uh, uh, lack of bread and staples in, uh, around various places around the world, including Egypt. Egypt gets a lot of its wheat from Ukraine. And in the past, Egypt has, has had bread riots um, over the price of bread. So you could actually, so Ukraine is actually a very important country. Um, geopolitically, to go back to when I talked about geopolitics, if you look at where it's located, besides the fact of, of the, of the, the agri it's agricultural, the, the wheat production, things like that, um, it's very important because it's basically been sort of a buffer state between Russia and, and NATO and Europe, but Ukraine is a democracy. And Ukraine is important to the United States for a lot of reasons, but the main, uh, one of the main reasons why, why I believe Putin wants to destroy Ukraine, to destroy Ukraine and, may, and force it back into Russia or force it into Russia is Putin cannot countenance the idea of a Slavic Orthodox Christian Russian-speaking democracy bordering Russia. Because Ukraine is basically a, a, a living example of why the Russians deserve better than what they have. Um, it's Western-oriented, it's democratic, um, it's vibrant, um, it's, it's, it's Slavic. Again, you know, a lot of them are Russian-speaking. Orthodox Church is the majority of, of, the, of the faith. Very similar to Russia in those ways, but it's democratic. It's kind of almost like a North Korea, South Korea kind of thing. Uh, not that stark, but almost that way. And as long as that exists, um, it, it's, it's, it's a thorn in Putin's side because Putin wants to become more authoritarian. There are multiple reasons why he wants to get rid of it, but that, why he wants to eliminate Ukraine as an independent country. Um, if he takes Ukraine, um, and, and again, his logic is, he, he's saying that, you know, it, 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 Putin said for, for the past 20 years, Putin has said that in his view, the greatest catastrophe in um, world history or the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. And he said, none of the changes after the collapse of the Soviet Union were legitimate. Well, all of the NATO countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and the countries that used to be part of the Warsaw Pact, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, Poland, you know, what, what happens with them? I mean, it, so th th this is a really serious, I, I, I would just sort of really push back on the idea that it's, that it's not important. That being said, to get to Taiwan, um, the United States has had a longer relationship with Taiwan because the United States supported the Chinese nationalists since the 1949 revolution in China, okay? Um, but the United States does not recognize Taiwan as a sovereign country. We stopped doing that in the 1970s when we recognized the People's Republic of China. So it's a different kind of thing. If, if China were to invade Taiwan, which would be very difficult, by the way, it's not just driving tanks across the border. They have to cross the Taiwan Straits. They have to have a massive amphibious operation massive to take over this island that is very well defended and has a lot of American aircraft and a lot of American trained military, okay? Um, but if they were to do that, um, internationally, it would be a very uh, upsetting thing, but it, it would be a different order of magnitude from Ukraine because Ukraine is a sovereign state that is a member of the United Nations. Ukraine is a fully sovereign state and you had one sovereign state invading another sovereign state. And that is the ultimate uh, cause of war um, in international relations. China taking Taiwan um, would be a, a slightly less order of magnitude in the inter from the eyes of the international community. It would still lead to a lot of reaction and it would be a very bloody fight. Um, but you see what I'm saying? So, but, so there's that level, but at the same time, the, his the history, and I, this is where I do agree with what, what, what your, 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 the panelists were saying, the, the history of America's relationship with Taiwan is, I would argue, I would argue is deeper and longer than the American relationship with Ukraine. But the European relationship with Ukraine um, and Ukraine wanting to be a part of the European Union, Ukraine being a, a Western oriented country um, and America being a, a major part of the Atlantic Alliance, that, that brings us there, okay? So they're, 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 they're both very important situations. They're both very important to the United States, but they're different. Thank you so much. Sure. All right, Pierre, we have a ton of questions here. I've kind of read, read, read through a bunch of them and I'll try to maybe consolidate a couple of them into a, a single question. Um, so one has to do with the reaction of China, North Korea, and so forth. How, what factors in this event, in the Ukraine situation, 
might lead China and North Korea and its ilk to behave one way versus another? And what outcome would uh, change their behavior one way or another? So the great question that those are the big kind of like speculative if questions. Um, and, uh, but what I would say is, um, like I said before, I, I think China's paying very close attention to this for multiple reasons. One, um, first of all, I think they're, they're, they're looking at, you know, how easy or hard has it been and will it be for Russia to basically take over another country that is hostile to it and doesn't want to be taken over, okay? Um, that's one, one thing. They're looking at what the Russians are doing and also what can they learn, okay? What can they learn tactically and strategically from what the Russians are, are, are doing wrong? What could they maybe do better, all right? So they're looking at that. They're looking at the international response, um, the, the, the types of sanctions, the response, the outrage, um, especially, not, not just at the fact that Russia has gone in, but the types of, types of tactics that Russia is using, um, the response to this. I mean, the fact I, there, there's gonna be a war crimes uh, investigation and could, there very well could be some war crimes charges against Russian officers, against Putin, against top generals, things like that, which means that if they ever, if they ever set foot, if they're indicted on war crimes, if they ever set foot in any country that is a signatory to the International Criminal Court, they could be arrested and put on trial the way Milosevic was. Um, and he died in prison waiting for, to be tried for war crimes from, from, or, or the way the people who were involved in the Rwandan genocide were. I mean, it, you know, you, it, you can't be arrested in Russia, but you said you leave, you leave Russia um, and, and that could happen. So, the, so they're watching, I think they're watching that. They're also watching, uh, you know, how is Ukraine fighting? Because I, th I think what, what, the, what the Chinese might, might see from this is A, um, attacking another place and trying to take it over is, is hard. Um, the international community may not like it and the people might fart, fight really, really hard. Um, and to what extent might that affect how they think about Taiwan? I don't know. Um, we'll have to see what happens. We don't know about that. Um, but I think those are factors that they're looking at. I think, I think they're definitely looking at that. Um, now, uh, Taiwan, uh, China, and China has a very strong emotional um, claim to Taiwan that, from the Chinese perspective, is probably well. I, I can't say that. It, it's very, very, very strong claim that they have for Taiwan. Um, other people would say, wait a minute, you know, to what extent did China ever really own Formosa, the island that became Taiwan? That, that's a debatable kind of thing. But from their perspective, it's like this was ours, and it's a breakaway. They see it as a breakaway province. Ukraine is a little bit different. So again, they're, they're, they're different kinds of things. But I, I, think, I, think, um, I think China is definitely looking at this um, and, and, and to see what, you know, what, what can they learn from the Ukrainian resistance that might apply to China, Taiwan? What can they learn from the, the, the use of a, of a military force by a major power like Russia? And what can they learn from the international community? Um, and, and what they do with it, we'll have to see what happens. I, I can't speculate into that future. All right. Uh, Betty, you got a, another student question there. No, not for now. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so there's a couple of questions in about uh, whether Russia, what their view is of the uh, what eastward expansion of NATO. Do they have some reason, legitimate reason to be concerned here? Yeah, so um, there's gonna be a lot of, uh, there already is a lot of soul searching in a sense um, about you know the NATO expansion and then you know, after the end of the Cold War, um, was that a good thing? Was that you know uh, provoking Russia? Um, and and there's there are different ways of looking at this. Um, so first of all, if should countries have the right to self determination? A country becomes democratic. It's no longer part of the Soviet Union. It becomes a democratic state, or it's no longer part of the Warsaw Pact, like Poland. It becomes a democratic state. Should it have the right to decide who it wants to align itself with? Um, does Poland have the right to say we want to be part of the European Union and we want to be part of NATO, or do they not? Now, here's the thing. Uh, this is where realism and liberal internationalism and idealism sort of come in, actually, it, it give us different answers to that question. So John Mearsheimer, who is another very, very well-known uh, international relations theorist, who is a hardcore realist, unlike Eikenberry, who wrote our chapter for the Great Decisions book, who's a liberal internationalist, okay? Mearsheimer has a, a there's a, an article in the, uh, in the New Yorker, like uh, just in the last couple of days, an interview with him, where basically he's saying it's NATO's fault. Because what he's saying is, is that, that the United the NATO should not have moved eastward um, because basically he's looking at it from a great power perspective. Let the Russians have their sphere of influence. Let the West have its sphere of influence. And Poland, the Baltic states, this is my, this is my take on Mearsheimer. Poland, the Baltic states, be damned. 
Who cares about them? What matters is our relationship with Russia is balance of power, okay? And that's from a realist perspective. Morality plays no role. Self-determination plays no role. It doesn't matter whether you're a democratic country or, or an authoritarian country. What matters is your power position. And from that perspective, um, we should have basically said to all these countries, no, you cannot join us. You cannot join the democratic West. You're not a welcome in the European Union. You're not welcome in NATO because we're afraid of antagonizing Russia. And so, and we wanna have you as a buffer state. Um, now, from a, a, an American idealist perspective, um, we, who believe in, 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 we believe in equality and democracy and self-determination, you know, wait a minute, no, we want, you in on our, we want you in our camp. From a liberal institutionalist perspective and say, well, what really what matters is we need to have rules and norms and institutions that bind everybody together. We want, we want you to have this opportunity. So uh, 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 an, Ameri an idealist or a liberal institutionalist would have said yes to NATO expansion. A realist probably would have said no to NATO expansion. Now, that's kind of a theoretical perspective of this. From the Russian perspective, first of all, they didn't like the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and, you know, and this is another thing to understand, going all the way back to the Cold War, back to 1947, um, uh, uh, when um, you know, we started with containment, you know, from, from the, the Western perspective, we were containing Russia. But from the Russian perspective, containment was encirclement. You know, and, 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 but on the other hand, you know, again, you know, it's a democratic world versus a non-democratic world. So the, the, I, I guess my answer is it really depends on, on what color lenses you're putting on to look at this situation. Um, did NATO expansion um, threaten Russia? Potentially. On the other hand, should we have told these newly democratic countries, no, you're not, you're not welcome to join the democratic club? You're not welcome to be part of NATO because we're afraid of Russia? Um, maybe it should, hey, Russia, get over yourself. Maybe R Russia, maybe you should be coming democratic. You know, maybe you should not be a, a brutal dictatorship. I mean, again, now maybe I'm wearing sort of an idealistic lens here now as opposed to a realist, but it, it, you see what I'm saying? So there's different ways of looking at this. Um, and, uh, but right now, um, the, I, but I will say one final thing and then we'll go on to the next question. And that is, it was never, it was never realistic that Ukraine was gonna be allowed to join NATO. That was really never in the cards. And everybody knew it, Putin knew it. Now, Ukraine joining the European Union, that was probably going to happen over time, okay? But NATO understood that if we bring Ukraine in, we've got NATO right on the Russian border. It's already uh, enough that we're on the Baltics, you know, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. Um, but Ukraine was not gonna, that, that's not gonna be the case. But European Union, yes. Finland is also European Union, but not NATO, and it's on the Russian border. The likelihood of, of Ukraine going in the direction of Finland down the line, that was, that was a plausible thing. NATO was not. Um, Russia and Putin using NATO expansion as the excuse, it's an excuse. It's BS, frankly, because what he said flat out was Ukraine does not have the right to exist as a country. Ukraine is not a country, he said. Ukraine is not a country. The Ukrainians are really Russians. They have no right to independence whatsoever in any form. NATO is an excuse. NATO expansion was an excuse for Putin. Um, and he held off for four years because, because uh, 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 as, you, as you guys have probably heard, John Bolton just said um, a few days ago, um, that, uh, that Trump planned on pulling the United States out of NATO had he won a second term. And Putin pretty much understood that. And that's why he didn't do anything for four years. He was waiting for, Putin, for, for Trump to get reelected. And then if the United States pulled out of NATO, he could have done whatever the hell he wanted. But look at NATO now. NATO is robust and it's, and it's holding Russia off. Yeah. Interesting. Um, several questions about oil and um, whether or not the West is prepared for this in terms of uh, its understanding of the relationship of oil, the uh, canceling of the Keystone pipeline in the United States and, and so forth and other things that are going on in terms of uh, our dependence on oil. So have we really done a bad job ourselves in preparing for this? You know, uh, this is a case where this is a case of conflicting interests. The United States has different interests and they're in conflict with each other. It's in the interest of the United States to be energy independent. It's in the interest of the United States for the, the world to be less dependent on fossil fuels, right? Um, but at the same time, uh, we, we don't want, um, we, we wanna shut down the Russian economy. Um, we wanna do those, those kinds of things. Um, and in order to be energy independent and or to become more independent immediately, we're gonna to have to probably rely more on, on more fossil fuels. The global economy runs on oil. The global economy runs on oil. All those ships, all the container ships that bring us all of our stuff, they're all powered by oil. All the planes are powered by oil. 
one day, 30, 50, 100 years from now, maybe we'll have uh, electric powered uh, super tankers, okay? But the like, or, or, or giant freighters, the likelihood of that happening in, in my lifetime is pretty nil, I, I would say. Maybe, maybe I'll be proven wrong. The global economy runs on oil. So even if we're energy depend, in, independent and we're not, we're not, we don't import a, a, a barrel of oil from any other country, the price of oil is affected by the global supply, right? And so if, if, uh, if, if Russia is shut off um, and the supply goes down, the, the, the thing's gonna go through the roof. And of course, we all know also markets are very uh, skittish and markets don't like uncertainty and there's nothing but uncertainty right now, which is also driving the price of oil up. So these are some of the things that are happening. So now the United States is in a situation where if we wanna start getting other countries to replace the oil, that Russia is not going to be selling, especially if we can get the Europeans to do it. Now we're talking about going to Venezuela, and we have a boycott on Venezuelan oil. Um, Venezuela, which is a brutal, brutal authoritarian regime, used its oil money to basically fund what it was doing. So are we going to start buying Venezuelan oil and then basically fueling that regime? Uh, what about Iran? Are we going to start lifting sanctions, but we don't have a nuclear deal? Are we going to enter that? That becomes really, really super complicated. Biden, the Biden, Biden has a very bad relationship with Saudi Arabia because unlike, Trump had a good relationship with Saudi Arabia. Biden doesn't because, frankly, Biden didn't like Saudi Arabia. He attacked Saudi Arabia for the, for the murder of uh, Jogi, um, other kinds of things as well. You know, Saudi Arabia has some of the worst human rights record on the, on the entire planet. From an American values, idealist perspective, we shouldn't be dealing with Saudi Arabia. From a realist perspective, we have to deal with Saudi Arabia because they have the second largest proven oil reserves in the world, and we need them to increase their production to help us offset the, the things from Russia. So it's a very kind of, again, it's balancing these different interests um, of what to do. Down the line, it's, it is in the America's national interest to wean ourselves off of oil. It's in our strategic interests. It's in the interest of climate change. It's consistent with our values. Because frankly, most, most, not all, but a lot, a lot of the major oil, produce in the, oil producers in the world are very, very brutal authoritarian regimes. Russia, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Iran, okay? Some of them are democracies like, like Canada, Mexico, um, Nigeria, but, but, but a lot of them are not. Um, and, and, uh, and it's bad for the environment. All these kinds, we, we need to do that down the line. But right now, immediately, we need to do something about Russia. And so that's, that's a conflicting set of interests that are going on. Um, you know, and and the, the idea of the Keystone Pipeline is if we wean ourselves off of oil, you shut down, you, you don't let that pipeline go forward in order to, to give more room for alternative sources of energy, renewables, but the renewables aren't online yet, at, at least not, not at the capacity to take over the oil that we're missing. So there's a short-term interest and the long-term interest. The short-term interest and the long-term interest are in conflict, and we have conflicting interests at the same time uh, as well. I, I think I, I hopefully you followed, you followed what I was saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there, uh, do you think there's a, a red line a uh, that Putin could cross here that would actually cause the West to engage militarily? Yeah, if they go into a NATO country, that's the red line. Yeah. If, they, if they attack uh, any, any NATO member, um, that, that will do Article 5. And, and uh, NATO has made that very clear. And I think what has to happen is if they do it, NATO has to follow through. Um, if, if, uh, if, if Russia attacks a NATO member, and, and the response is not full-blown full blown military. Um, and if they deliberately attack, I mean, if they deliberately attack a NATO member and it's not full-blown military, then the game's over. And then, and then basically uh, NATO will crumble down the line and Russia will become uh, an aggrandizing country, um, potentially not unlike Nazi Germany um, in Europe. And uh, I'm not saying that he's like Hitler, but I mean, in terms of the, the ambitions and, and, and the unstoppable. Um, so that, that's the red line. The red line is, is, uh, is Poland uh, and the Baltic states or anywhere else if he crosses that line. And that's one reason why the US and NATO does not want to be involved in a no-fly zone, um, enforcing it, because that, that is the line right there. Um, it, it's a physical line. Moldova is not a red, red line. I'm sorry, say again? Moldova is not a red line. Moldova is not, not a member of NATO. Um, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, it, it uh, when you when you say a red line crossing it in which in which NATO would get involved militarily against Russia, um, I don't see it, it going to war over Moldova. Mm -hmm. um, it would be unfortunate, um, but uh, I mean I, I don't want to see I, I I'm not a warmonger. I don't want to see a war between Russia and and, the, and NATO. I want to see Russia back down, which is not likely to happen. Um, and uh, and it, it, I, I may I might be kind of more animated tonight than I usually am, um, but I, I you, you might have picked up I have a clear bias, mm -hmm. and my bias is in favor of democracy. And and so th this is this is a this is a major 
a major issue um, that, that the, the free world um, has to take a stand on, in my view. And I think we are taking a stand, um, short of going to an actual kinetic war with Russia, unless they cross those lines. Um, that, that's, that's my take. Um, maybe there's a couple of questions here about sort of internal politics in Russia. Uh, disinformation, blocking out Western news media coverage and, and uh, demonstrations in Russia. What, what impact do you think that is having uh, internally it's, it's in Russia? It, it, it really, yeah. so I wrote, a, um, I wrote a column uh, for this, it's gonna be in, the, in, in this Friday's uh, Indianapolis Business Journal. And there's a, a 10 day delay. So whenever I su submit a column to the editors, it's 10 days before it gets printed. That's the way it works, okay? And so here I'm writing a column about, about Ukraine, knowing that what, what's, what you're gonna read was written 10 days earlier. And I'm trying to think, okay, what, what can I say that's not gonna be obvious by the time it goes to print? And uh, I, one of the things I talked about, uh, again, when I wrote it, was the protests that were taking place in Russia and the fact that they were really large and that plus you know, mothers uh, with their kids coming home in body bags, maybe those things might put pressure on Russia. What I didn't know was a couple, what I couldn't, didn't see coming was a couple days after I, I submitted the, uh, the column to the editors, the Duma, the Russian, Russia's a rubber stamp legislature passed these new laws um, that criminalize telling the truth. Um, and, you know, it, it, so basically if you use the word war or invasion, um, you can go, you, in print, you can go to prison for 15 years in Russia. Um, and, and they basically have shut down whatever was left of a free press has completely shut down. Um, and so now, uh, and they've, 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 blocked, they've, they've shut down Facebook and Facebook and Twitter. I don't know about Twitter. If they've shut down Facebook and YouTube and TikTok, I'm not sure about Twitter yet. Um, they've shut them down. So really the only way even younger Russians can even get to social media is by using VPNs and doing all these fancy kinds of things. It's tough to do. The bottom line though, is that right now, um, most Russians seem to be believing the propaganda from state media. And what the Russians are telling them is there is no war, there is no invasion, the Ukrainians are killing themselves, the Ukrainians are actually bombing themselves, the Russians are not targeting any civilians, um, nothing, nothing is happening, we're, we're not fighting a war, um, we're, we're, we're saving the Ukrainians from this neo-Nazi um, uh, gang of drug dealers, okay? And a lot of Russians are believing that. They have no other access to any other information. And you guys have probably seen, you've been covering this, you've been watching this on TV or whatever. There are even Russians in America, Russians in Ukraine. They're calling their family back home in Russia and their family, even their parents aren't believing what they're telling them. They're saying, look, I mean, this is what's happening and they're not believing them. No, I believe what Russian state television is telling me. And so they're, 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 the, the protests are getting smaller, which I thought was actually gonna get larger. Um, the protests are getting smaller. Access to information is basically shut off. Um, and and, and uh, it's, it's a... It, it, you didn't. You wouldn't have. You would not have thought that in the 21st century you could hermetically seal off a country. But Putin is doing the best that he can to do that, um, and and it's and that's going to make it much more difficult internally for something to happen um, to uh, to affect Putin, who again is not accountable to the people anyway. Um, so that that's that's a problem. What I was hoping for was more of a more information, more of a free press. As 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 Russian uh, soldiers come back dead, 18 and 19 year old conscripts. Um, as their body starts coming back, maybe parents will start doing something. Maybe that will happen. We'll have to see. But but it's the idea of a, of a grassroots opposition is being shut down every time it pops up by the Russians. And the access to information is being closed off. And uh, that's much worse than I think anybody actually believed could have happened this quickly. Um, right, well, Eddie, I, you want to take us Yeah, on? I wanted to say uh, while you're on this, Pierre, you can correct this if this is, I, uh, a correspondent was mentioning this sentence. Uh, this past week, that we here in the United States may look at a 15-year sentence and think, oh my gosh, people get that for having marijuana in their car. Uh, in Russia, people get sent to, according to the correspondent, people get sent to jail for five years for murder. And so a 15-year sentence yes, is a yes. big sentence yes. for, for simply trying to speak out Absolutely. And, and say, well, I read this in the New York Times. Well, you've got 15 And, and that's, that's the maximum. The other thing too is even if you're charged with a crime in Russia, it can ruin your entire life. In terms of the ability to get a to get a job, um, to get to get a home, all and, and so people understand that. So basically, they're terrified. I mean, this is like the, what what uh, some political scientists back in the '60s used to call it psychic terror. This is what totalitarian regimes would do. You don't need to have just have a state state police, a secret police. You can just terrorize people in their own heads. And so that and, and so he's basically reinstituting in some ways the kind of psychic terror that you used to see under Stalin. Um, and and uh, it's it, it, we'll see how effective it is, but it's it's a uh, it, it, just like nobody saw the swiftness and the effectiveness of the sanctions, 
I don't think anybody saw just how quickly he'd be able to crack down on, on media and the press and, and, and do it in such a way that people are not believing what's actually happening in the real world. And the, the, only, the only news in Russia is actually fake news and it's official. I need to say we're losing our room yeah. soon here at Purdue University. So okay. if, if right. maybe we're, we're, one we're more out of time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, was, uh, I was going to say we do one more question, but yes, but, yes, one more. We're going to take okay. our we're just going to so, take our chances. There was, there was a question about uh, the motivations for why those countries um, uh, abstained in the vote in the United Nations. You know, I'm, I'm sure different countries had different. Yeah, reasons. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean. Um, well, some might be, you know, they, they, they don't want to be on, they don't want to get involved. They, they, they want to stay neutral. They don't want to take sides, a, a lot of them. Um, some are intimidated by Russia. Um, some also might have been following China's lead. A lot of the countries that abstained uh, have very heavy China invest, Chinese investment with the Belt and Road Project and other kinds of things. And it could be that they were, you know, if China was abstaining, they were going to abstain. I don't know if there was actually behind the scenes pressure for them to abstain. Um, but that, that was, uh, there, there, again, there, there were multiple reasons. Some were countries that were um, traditionally uh, pro-Russia. Venezuela abstained. They didn't vote in favor, but they abstained, which is no surprise. Um, Cuba abstained. Cuba didn't vote in favor. I, I mean, Cuba did not vote with Russia. Cuba abstained. Venezuela, which is kind of interesting. I mean, so that, what's also, there's another way of looking at this, and that is, why did they abstain? That, that's really bad. On the other hand, look at all the countries that normally would have voted with Russia that instead abstained. And that also might be the news, okay? China did not vote with Russia. China abstained. I mean, nobody took Russia's side except for the rogue states, you know, it, it, uh, uh, North, North Korea um, and, and, uh, and Syria, you know, and, and Belarus. Uh, and by the way, Belarus is not sending any troops in. And that says something too. I mean, it, 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 the abstentions, again, you can look at it two ways, but the abstentions in some ways actually signal even further how isolated Russia is. Because in the past, those countries would have voted with Russia, right? So, um, but it, so there are multiple reasons, though. Sure. Uh, didn't he also ask for troops from Kazakhstan? He just recently said- And they refused, yes. Kazakhstan they, wouldn't, refused. they wouldn't send troops either, or? No, they would, they would, they would not send. And, and so that, that there's two quick things about that. One is the fact that they wouldn't send them is sending a signal. The other is the fact that Putin felt he had to ask for them is another signal of just how badly his army is doing, okay? That he needed, that the, that the 200,000 Russian troops are not enough and they're not effective enough and they're not competent enough to do the job. All right. That's why they're attacking civilians. Thank That's you. why they're bombarding civilian targets. All right. Betty, do you want to kind of take us home here? Well, yeah. Dr. Atlas, you do not disappoint. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wish this you could go fun. to the union. <laughs> I wish you could, wish you could go to the union with us. We get to carry this on. Yeah. Um, Have a beer this, for me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm making a glass of wine. Okay, um, yeah. That was great. Thank you so much. Uh, I know we've been talking about Ukraine and then Russia, and then, but this is um, this has captured our imaginations, our hearts, our conversations. I well, I, I I'm a little older than you. I think Ray and I could probably say, and Larry, that aside from the Cuban Missile Crisis, I can't think of anything that has in our lifetime after World War II that has been as threatening to the world as this. Yeah, I I, I would agree. Yeah, yeah would, and and yeah. and it, it was a nuclear problem at that time with a far smaller level of sophistication. And with the Khrushchev that, uh, Khrushchev was not, he, he may have come from sort of like a, a backward, back, awkward background, but he wasn't unlevel. He was, Putin is just unlevel. He is just at this point uh, unlevel. And so it makes it even more dangerous. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good question, really good questions, both from the students and from everybody else too. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, and right, thank you for good. those of you who have attended with us. Uh, please join us again next week. It's really hard to always talk with us because I, I feel like we want to carry on with the really, our programs are so engaging. We just don't, okay, well, thank you so much. Now next week we're going to be talking about, but that's what we have to do. We need to talk about next week's program. It's going to be on Thursday night. Uh, you'll be joining us with the Distinguished Speakers Program. We're going to have Dr. Gardner Bovington, and he's going to be talking about the Uyghurs in China. This is another very serious problem that I'm sure China is welcoming this distraction because before before all this happened, there was a tremendous amount of attention being paid to what is a genocide, an accusations of genocide against the Uyghurs in China, in Western China. And so China's probably welcoming this distraction because God knows what's going on with that uh, group right now. That will be uh, March the 17th at 7 p.m. Again, you do have to register and then join us again in two weeks as Great Decisions talks about 
changing demographics. We really had kind of a tough one with finding a speaker for this because what exactly did changing demographics mean? <laughs> and so we were really perplexed. We wanted to bring somebody who could really uh, bring for us um, and, and have a very insightful and a very exciting evening um, as we have had this evening. Once again, thank you, Pierre. Uh, we love having you. So you can probably count on next year being your 18th year. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, God willing, we are all here. So thank you, everybody. And from Purdue University, I want to say good night and thank you very much. And boiler up. Can I say boiler up? <laughs> That'll drive half of you crazy out there. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, there we go.